The next speaker is Katriona McCallum. Uh, she is currently Senior Advocacy Manager at PLOS, a consulting editor on PLOS One, and a member of the boards of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association and Open Air. She entered publishing in 1998 as the assistant editor of the Elsevier journal Trends in Ecology and Evo Evolution. Became the editor in 1999 and managing editor in 2001. She joined PLOS in July 2003 as one of the launch editors of PLOS and PLOS Biology. She was a senior editor on PLOS Biology for 10 years and was involved in the planning stages of the PLOS Community Journals and PLOS One. Uh, uh, she took a sabbatical from PLOS in 2007 to 2008 as an invited fellow of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin. Uh, she has a PhD from Edinburgh University on the evolutionary ecology and gen genetics of specification. She has spoken and written extensively about the transformation of scholarly publishing and is keen advocate of open access, open science, and the reform of scholarly communication. Uh, she will talk today about scientific communication on trial, so please welcome Katriona McCallum. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank um, Anna, actually both Annas, um, the Young Academy, for inviting me to come and speak today. Um, and what I'm going to do, I, I've, I've entitled my, uh, uh, called my talk Scientific Communication on, on Trial, um, because I think there are some systemic problems um, that we have with the process of communication. I'm, I'm not talking about uh, uh, the product um, as such. Um, there's fantastic science out there, as we heard from Bruce this morning. But it's the actual process of communication. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about PLOS, and then I'm going to focus on, on four particular areas. And if there is something going wrong, then <clears throat> we need to discuss what the motive is uh, for that. Um, and I, uh, there'll be no prizes for guessing where I'm going. We've heard um, several speakers this morning talk about some of the problems. And then what are the potential solutions? Um, so PLOS is a not-for-profit publisher and advocacy organization with a mission to transform uh, uh, research communication. And we now publish seven journals, and PLOS One is perhaps our best-known journal uh, and our largest journal, but we actually launched with PLOS Biology in 2003, and PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine were really to show that open access was compatible with high-quality science. Um, the remaining journals are, are uh, more like society um, journals. PLOS Biology and PLOS Medicine are um, run with uh, professional editors, and I was one for, for many years. Um, the community journals, um, as we call them, are run more like societies, and editorial decisions are taken entirely by the um, academics running the journals. PLOS One is a bit different, um, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, what is open access. Um, we need to define this because there are so many different versions out there. Um, we think it's free access. There's no charge to access. There's no embargoes. So any work is immediately available. And there is a license. We give the copyright to authors, but the work is licensed with a very liberal reuse license, which allows others to reuse any of the material as long as it is appropriately, appropriately attributed. So PLOS One. So PLOS One, uh, when it started, um, we decided it, we wanted to be multidisciplinary. It was on loan only. It's open access. It has a large independent editorial board. The crucial difference um, that PLOS One made and its key innovation was to try and remove uh, the subjectivity, whether an article was interesting or not, from whether the article was actually rigorous. And we were surprised ourselves by the huge um, support this journal got and the success. And I think its success has been mirrored because so many other, other publishers have um, uh, taken up a similar model. And so <clears throat> PLOS One in numbers, and this is just for 2014, we um, published more than 32,000 publications. We had more than 57,000 submissions. It's handled by six, more than 6,000 academic editors. More than, we have more than 450,000 reviewers, 8,000 reviews, I mean 450,000 authors, authors 140,000 reviews of those articles, 180,000 citations, and more than 5 million page views per month of those 
of those articles. So it's, it is a massive journal. But <clears throat> and what I want to talk about, and I will be drawing on our experience of, of PLOS One, um, are these four uh, uh, types or four um, parameters, if you like, of scholarly communication. Um, and the first is dissemination. And this is a typical uh, image of a research life cycle. Um, you can find loads of them on the web. This one's from, from JISC. And the publication is a core part of that research life cycle. And this is the definition of what a journal does from the Scientific, Technical, and Medical Association. So journals form a core part of the process of scholarly communication, are an integral part of the scientific research itself. Journals do not just disseminate information, they also provide a mechanism for the registration of the author's precedence, maintain quality through peer review, and provide a fixed archival version for future reference. And my argument today is really to question the role of the journal um, in this process. We certainly know it's enormously successful. There's more than 28,000 uh, uh, journals um, publishing about 2.5 million articles a year, up to at least 10,000 journal publishers, um, with some estimate between 7 and 9 million researchers contributing to them. And most publishers have their content um, online, so at one level that's a dissemination of success. We also know it's an enormously successful business model and the revenues are estimated at about 10 billion, uh, and the broader um, publishing market is worth about 25.2 uh, billion. Um, in terms of uh, dissemination by open access, and I, I think um, dissemination in a subscription journal is actually a dissemination failure um, if you can't actually access that information. I'm a member of the board of the um, Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, and we publish the number of articles produced by our members, so this is a subset of those articles. And there's no doubt it's definitely increasing. And there was a report recently, a uh, uh, review done by Stephen Pinfield, and the estimates vary between 20 and 50% of, of the scholarly literature. And again, it depends how you define open access. We also know that the large subscription publishers are doing incredibly well. Um, and in fact, open access for many of them is an additional revenue stream. Um, this, this was done by a business analysis called Claudio Espezi, and actually one of his conclusions was that open access was failing because it wasn't uh, providing the solution to the serials crisis and the increasing costs of publication. Um, and so I think if we're just looking at the, the dissemination function of journals, there are many publishers which remain resistant to open access, there are few conversions uh, of established journals to open access. Hybrid open access, where you can pay for an article within a subscription journal to make it freely available, is incredibly expensive. Um, m more to the point, details of methods and results are often relegated to the supplementary material where it's hard to find. There are often numerous rounds of unnecessary rejection and re-review. Re um, journals are very reluctant to publish negative or confirmatory results. And the content is often uh, not reusable or discoverable. And I'm not talking about text mining today, but text mining is hugely um, important. But most publishers don't allow text mining to the content of, of their articles. But more to the point, it's no longer just about journals and books. There are a whole range of different platforms. And I've got GitHub up there. There was a question about it this morning. Software, data. Um, and different, uh, different platforms providing different sorts of information that scientists are using. And there's also the infrastructure to, to, uh, um, to back that up and to support that. Um, so publishing is no longer a cycle, or the research life cycle is not a cycle. It's much more of a network. And one of the questions we have to ask is whether journals are fit for purpose in a digital age where we're trying to enable the sort of collaboration and the sort of uh, um, uh, communication that can be provided by uh, an open uh, network of scientists. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, peer review. And so peer review is considered um, as the gold standard. Um, we've heard a bit, a bit, a bit of it, uh, about it today, but we know that it is often slow and delays access to research. Um, Peer review generally occurs uh, before publication. And just to distinguish the sort of uh, peer review that Tony was talking about, that was very much about grant reviewing of, of, of articles after they were published. I'm focusing very much on the uh, pre-publication peer review. It tends to be conservative and risk-averse. 
We know there are increasing accounts that it is biased, whether by gender or from particular countries. There are increasing accounts that it is fraudulent. And moreover, it's a black box. We actually don't know what goes on behind it because it all generally happens behind closed doors. And what is the scale of the problem? Well, the scale of PLOS One enables us to see those, uh, the sorts of problems that are occurring across the literature at scale. So whereas journals might see these uh, relatively rarely, when you're publishing more than 33,000 articles a year, you see uh, a lot more of this. And PLOS One actually goes through a whole series of rigorous checks on every manuscript before it ever gets uh, passed over to an academic to handle through peer review. And we can pick up some of these things on the list, um, but we can't pick up them all. And things like plagiarism, figure manipulation, fake results, undeclared competing interests, publication bias, statistical manipulation, lack of e ethical approval, data theft, and, and fake peer review. We can also see the sort of variety of the types of reviews that we get from researchers. And there's varied levels of detail and varied levels of expertise. I mean, most peer reviewers are actually not trained. Most editors are not trained. Training happens when they actually go onto a journal and have to start, start doing peer review. Um, we see bias, we sometimes see very offensive um, reviews, and primarily it's just hugely um, inconsistent. Now, I'm not saying that all peer review is bad. Um, I've handled and I've had the privilege to handle thousands of papers through peer review, and some are, are uh, enormously constructive, um, and, uh, and probably the majority are, and um, people take reviewing enormously seriously. But we are seeing increasing um, problems um, across the landscape, and it is not just PLOS One. Peer review is a global challenge. So recently there were um, fake peer reviewers that were provided, and we think probably by third uh, party authoring services, which basically um, handled the papers on behalf of authors, suggested reviewers' names, uh, and then wrote the reviews of the papers um, and ensured that they would get the publication. Um, and it's not just open access publishers, um, it's also in Springer. Um, we've seen it from Sage. Um, and it's not just fake peer reviews, but we also have um, issues about whether peer review, even when it's trying to do its best, is working. Um, this is a very high profile paper that um, was uh, in science, which I, I think hasn't yet been retracted. But it's not just science, it happens also in PLOS One and every other journal. I'm sure you can all think of, of in uh, different types of cases. And I think there are false expectations about what we expect from peer review. We expect peer review to police the literature, um, but science has become uh, much more cross-disciplinary and much more complicated. There are huge data sets, numerous authors, and I think we have to ask the question whether two or three reviewers and one editor is sufficient to review some of the papers that are coming into these journals. Um, also, an anonymity tends to conceal or... Uh, um, or even engender negativity and bias in the review process. There are absolutely no incentives or rewards for constructive reviewing and providing uh, um, good com comments. And moreover, reviewers are actually reviewing for journals and for their editors. They're not necessarily reviewing for their colleagues or for other readers or for society at large. And again, as I've said, peer review is a black box. So peer review might be doing a good job overall, but we have no idea because all the data about it is behind closed doors. So we can, uh, there is no independent analysis of actually what is working in peer review. Um, the next issue is around reproducibility, and, and, and there's a lot of discussion about uh, uh, the reproducibility crisis in science. Um, I don't like the word reproducible because I think most people won't want to reproduce every single paper that's published. And we should talk more about the reliability of science. Um, and again, there's a lot of evidence that this is failing. And to speak to uh, Bruce's point uh, um, this morning, where the focus on translational research. Now, a lot of the evidence is coming from the translational um, research that we're, that, that we're seeing, where there is actually hyper-competition um, between labs to try and get papers published. And we're seeing uh, poorly designed studies, um, small sample sizes, uh, where there are experiments done, they're not randomized, um, some don't have controls. The data is not available, the data supporting the conclusions of the paper is not available to scrutinize. There's a lot of selective reporting. This is called uh, p-hacking, where you can basically 
engineer the analysis to ensure that you get a, a significant result, which makes publication more likely. Um, there's very poor reporting, so even where experiments have done appropriate measures in terms of blinding or randomization, they don't report they've done it. And again, negative results are not published. Um, in terms of the data availability, this was a study done by uh, Tim Vines that actually showed that the probability of finding the data associated with a paper declined by 17% um, every year. Um, and we know also uh, from, the, uh, uh, from studies that have been done, again, it's focusing on translational research, that um, this is not um, um, the poor reporting and the poor design is not a function of, of low quality review or being published in um, um, uh, sort of less reputable journal, because it turns out that higher ranked journals have more papers retracted, and papers in higher ranked journals are tend to report either no or inappropriate statistics. And I've put some references down. And last week at a conference, I also heard that there's an upcoming study on the quality of papers from highly ranked institutions. Um, and I <clears throat> there's no guesses for where that conclusion is going to be, I think. Um, and even within the literature, um, um, within, uh, uh, and Bruce talked a little bit this, uh, about this this, this morning, there's a bias to only um, cite those findings that either support your own thesis um, and support um, um, a, a, a positive or, or, or a, and support an established model. And this was a particular paper published in, in 2009 where they um, looked at the citations, and I think they looked at over 200,000 uh, citations to a particular paper that provided a link between a beta amyloid protein um, and a muscular um, disease. And 94% of the uh, citation flows, so they, they analyze down to, to actually flows of citations rather than individual citations, um, but the citations to the primary data that provided the initial support for that hypothesis, whereas there was only six papers, um, uh, where only 6% of citations went to papers that actually refuted that hypothesis. What's really interesting about this paper is they also analyze the context of these citations. Um, the hundreds of thousands of citations around these primary papers also um, made up facts, or they referred to intermediate citations um, and extended facts that weren't there. And in fact, the authors also go on to show how this body of supportive evidence for a particular hypothesis was also used um, in requests for grant funding from NIH. And so critical papers become um, almost invisible um, in this environment. And in fact, John Ionides, who's a professor at Stanford, has analyzed the literature, and, and he can show statistically, actually, why most published research findings are false. And um, this is one of our most highly viewed papers. It's had one and a half uh, million downloads and highly cited papers in um, at PLOS. I'm not going to say too much about evaluation because we've already heard about that, um, but we all know about the problems of the impact factor, and this was a, a tweet from Ben Sheldon, who's actually done a lot of work in Sweden, some of you may know of him, um, who showed that, uh, an editorial concluding that um, impact factors were a force, uh, not a force for good, and on the same web page, um, there's an advert proclaiming the impact factor of that journal. Um, Stephen Curry gave a wonderful talk last week um, at a conference, at the OASPA conference, um, and this echoes um, also what was said this morning, um, and that impact factors mask huge variation in citations. And he made the point um, very strongly, and he's written about this statistically. He's a professor at Imperial College, and he says, if you use it, you are dishonest and statistically illiterate. Um, which I think is probably true. And just to echo the same point um, that Ron was making this morning, um, this was a, a journal, so it's a chemistry journal, uh, where the impact factor was about two uh, for many, many years, and then suddenly shot up to 50 in 2008. Um, and uh, it was because of one single paper. And it didn't mean that every single other paper around, in that journal suddenly became awesome. Um, there, is a, there is a massive skew on the citation distributions. In fact, Stephen Curry was asking for publishers to publish the citation distributions to their journal just to show and to demonstrate how absurd the impact factor is. 
And in fact, um, PLOS One did this um, in 2012. Um, and this actually doesn't show as, as much of a skew as uh, some journals. Um, and, and there it showed 10% of, of papers had been cited at least uh, 29 times. The median was nine. But for a journal that's a sci you know, publishing 32,000 papers, any, you know, any number like this and an impact factor is completely meaningless. There's some great papers in there, and there's some neg papers that publish negative results or, or, or are confirmatory. They're not, they're not going to get cited as much. And moreover, the, this process um, affects early career researchers the most. Um, and this was a talk uh, given by an early career researcher um, um, again last week who concluded that career decisions for early career researchers are essentially arbitrary because they have very few publications. The peer review process is completely hit or miss. So whether they end up in a high impact factor journal or a low impact factor journal can actually um, affect their entire career path. So if we think things are going wrong, then... we. Okay, we have to talk about motive and opportunity. I've got five minutes, so I've got to rattle through the rest. This is an upcoming uh, study. This is still in, in, in prep, which says, uh, uh, which was an evolutionary model um, which tried to determine how researchers should behave in the current climate. And so given finite resources and the importance placed on novel findings and the emphasis on a relatively small number of publications in evaluation exercises, Scientists should conduct a large number of exploratory studies, um, which tend to be small, therefore they tend to be underpowered, and therefore most of them will be false. Um, also, the fact that uh, these types of studies are error-prone, there's some evidence that authors are more reluctant to share their data um, if they're aware or, or, or if the studies are smaller and likely to be full of errors. Um, and so the current incentive structures in science are likely to lead rational scientists to adopt an approach to maximize their career advancement, that is, to the detriment of the advancement of scientific knowledge. But it's not just researchers um, that, are, that uh, you know, are having to act like this in order to publish and design their journals. Journals gain financially from their brand. Institutions gain financially. Um, by hiring those faculty um, which are publishing in those brands and they can bring in more money that way or increase their rankings. And research assessment by funders is often based on very few publications and the impact factor. Um, so the verdict, and I'm not going to run through all of these things, but basically I think um, both dissemination, peer review, reporting and evaluation, the, uh, the sort of fundamental aspects of scholarly communication are failing. Um, and some of them, we don't know how badly they're failing because we don't have the evidence to actually independently analyze them. And that refers especially to peer review and to evaluation. And we know who the culprit is. And again, this is Stephen Curry. It's partly the, the culture that maintains traditional publishing. And the, you know, the benefit is that you create competition to get into these journals. Uh, but the downsides, and I've discussed many, many of these, uh, are so many that it's not clear that that trade-off is worth it. Um, unfortunately, he notes that getting rid of the impact factor has about as much hope as nuclear disarmament. I have more hope, hopefully. <laughs> and, and so briefly to talk about solutions. And I was going to talk about a wonderful um, study done by Aileen Fife, who's looked at the history of peer review. I'm not going to tell you much about that, but basically peer review as we know it is much younger than we think, um, especially within the independent journals that, the, the, that are not run by societies. So there is an opportunity to change. We don't have to be stuck with the status quo. And so one of the solutions is to focus on the content and not the wrapper, as Stephen Curry put it. And we've heard mention of DORA already. This is um, hugely important. Um, we also need to make uh, a range of metrics on the article, um, not just the impact factor available, but we don't want to replace the impact factor with another metric that is equally useful. And so these metrics, and, and PLOS has created an article, uh, um, a software to, create, uh, to look at a whole suite of article-level metrics um, that are associated with articles, and other publishers are adopting, uh, adopting these or creating these at their own. Um, and again, these data need to be openly available so that they are subject to independent scrutiny for others to analyze and see actually what works, because things work differently in different fields. So uh, we cannot expect to have one single metric that can apply to all of science. We also need to focus on sharing, collaboration, and reliability. So we need, we need more open access. 
Um, we absolutely need to separate the process of publication from evaluation. And I think this will allow the innovation that uh, Bruce was talking about. And we need to make more information available sooner. Uh, and preprints, I think, are going to be a huge game changer in this process. And we need uh, uh, more plus one style assessment, where we allow uh, researchers to publish rigorous science and we incentivize that, and then we uh, evaluate the merits of that article, whether it's interesting and innovative later. And I think we need to open up the black box of peer review. We need more, probably more reviewers. We need more eyes looking on the paper. And I think this is the value of preprint server. And we need to do it as soon as the article um, is available on the web before publication um, to try and, and um, get the right people focusing on the right papers. And we need to incentivize um, openness, collaboration, reliability and sharing. We need to be able to reward reviewers and reward open behavior. And this is open science. Okay, my last slide, essentially. To support this, um, we need to sort of change the way we think about um, scholarly communication. We actually need to apply the scientific method to scholarly communication itself. We need to know what works and what doesn't. And this is both in relation to peer review and to evaluation. And we need independent scrutiny, not just publishers telling you it works. We need independent scholars to look at this. We also need to align policies between funders, publishers, and institutions. And this is across the entire um, uh, research platform. We need to reduce the burden on researchers who are struggling um, to cope with all the different policies about open access and others at the moment. Um, and we need to create global community standards for open science. Science is done very differently in different parts of the world, and this is also adding to the burden of reviewers. And then finally, we need to build the infrastructure to support open science. And the one thing I want to point out there is, is if we have open peer review and if we have uh, researchers um, incentivized to publish their articles soon, we need to be able to track the work of, of those researchers, whether it's a paper or it's a constructive review. And we need um, persistent identifiers like ORCID um, to be built into the system and used by everyone. And in that way, we hope we can uh, make more published research true and also um, um, allow researchers to do what they're best at, which is actually research. So open access was just the start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you will soon get your possibility. I will start with a Twitter question. Uh, open access publishing often comes with rather large fees for us authors, which unfortunately make it a less realistic option. Reg regardless of the overall advantages, is there any way around this problem? Uh, well, um, I think there's two, two ways around the problem. I mean, unfortunately, the publishing market is not a functioning market. Um, one of the problems for the serials crisis in the first place um, was that um, uh, researchers needed access to all the work. You couldn't just say, I'll have one genetics journal. You had to have access to all of the genetics journals. And this imposed huge pressures on libraries um, to uh, provide all the journals at, at no matter what price was asked by the publishers. Um, open access, um, the idea of open access was to make the... Uh, the publication service, the, um, the actual service of providing a publication, um, what was paid for, not the, the, not the end product, not the actual article or the journal. And that this would stimulate competition between different services uh, and publishers uh, and different pub uh, providers. Um, you know, at the moment, I think the jury's out about whether um, APCs and the open access market, market I is functioning. I know there are an increasing number of funders who want to put a cap on the APCs that um, can be charged by publishers. We know that hybrid open access is, is much more expensive. And one of the reasons that publishers are saying, well, there's... Uh, 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 for, you know, traditional publishers are saying, well, they're more expensive, they're established journals, people will pay for them more. So it's absolutely nothing to do with what the service is providing um, in, terms, in terms of that. So I think there are issues. I think the, the, the jury, jury is out, probably. Thank you. And one short question. Uh, okay, just maybe... Um, what, in America, all the um, papers funded by NIH were 
forced to be put in PubMed Central because the taxpayer is paying for them. So why has it been so hard in Europe to force through that the normal person can look at their own taxpayers' funded research? I, um, I don't know, and, and I think, you know, uh, um, there are very different policies in different countries. I actually think um, the EU is incredibly regressive. Uh, progressive, not regressive at all. <laughs> very progressive. And um, um, uh, whereas other countries are much more um, regressive. And it actually, although the US has a public access policy, um, in terms, they don't um, enable the reuse of that material. So it might be free to read, but you can't use the information in it. Whereas actually, um, EU funders uh, want that to be uh, freely available and reusable. Um, there's also different ways. I think uh, uh, you know people are saying, well, uh, put articles in your institutional repositories and make it freely available at that, um, that way. I think there is a real problem, um, and it's, uh, again, what, reaching a, a crisis point in terms of there are so many different policies out there, and research is, is about global collaboration now. And when you're trying to juggle the policies of different, your different funders on the same papers, um, and I know there are a lot of upcoming uh, meetings and workshops getting different funders together to try and start to align those policies. Thank you, Katrina McCullough.